morning, everybody. My name is Fabian Levy, and I serve as Deputy Mayor for Communications for the City of New York. Thank you all for joining us for our weekly in-person media availability. As the mayor often says, New York City is not coming back. We are back. Our administration is laser-focused on protecting public safety, rebuilding our economy, and making our city more livable. And the perfect example of how we're doing all three is through our executive budget that invests in the working-class people who make this the greatest city in the world. Uh, these efforts span our entire administration, which is why the mayor has once again convened senior leadership from across the city government to discuss the work that we are doing every day for New Yorkers. Joining us today are Mayor Eric Adams, First Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright, Chief Advisor to the Mayor Ingrid Lewis Martin, Chief of, Chief of Staff Camille Joseph Warlick, Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services Ann Williams Isom, Deputy Mayor for Housing, Economic Development and Workforce Maria Torres Springer, Deputy Mayor for Operations Mayor Joshi, Deputy Mayor for Strategic Initiatives Anna Almanzar, Chief Counsel Lisa Zornberg, and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs Tiffany Radsbury. So without further delay, I'm pleased to turn it over to Mayor Adams. Thanks, thanks so much, uh, Fabian. Uh, you know, we're always clear uh, on message, came into office uh, two years and four months ago uh, with a clear mission, protect public safety, rebuild our economy, and make this city more livable uh, for all New Yorkers in general, general, but specifically working class people. And you know, don't just listen to me, don't take my word for it, uh, just look at what the San Francisco uh, Chronicle has uh, stated. Uh, last week they wrote, wrote, with world famous nightlife, a robust dating scene in a thriving tech community, it being New York City seemed the ideal spot for someone like Gupta. A recent study found that tech workers who leave the Bay Area are most likely to move to New York. N now flush with wealthy investors, companies big and small, and thousands of Bay Area defectors, New York has cemented itself as the nation's number two tech hub. Not only are you coming here to meet a new boss, but you come here and you can meet your boo. <laughs> we, the numbers don't lie. Keep showing you guys these charts over and over again. You want to write the narrative that New York is not winning. Look at the graph on public safety, safest big city in, in America. Big Apple gets bigger. Look at the close second. And some are decreasing. Look on the bottom. Look at that. The bars don't lie, folks. <laughs> That's why I'm so optimistic every day. We're not coming back. We're back. Bigger, better, and stronger than ever. This is an amazing, amazing job by this team that comes up here every day. Three things overshadow. Recidivism, uh, those who are dealing with severe mental health issues, and uh, the, uh, the, the third is random acts of violence. That's, you remove that off the table, the numbers will start coming clearer. Really good job, good work, you know. Um, Marsha, you should do a special on this. <laughs> uh, so really exciting what we're seeing. Um, the Big Apple's doing well, but you know, public safety is also the prerequisite of, of prosperity. While crime is going down across the city, uh, we are laser focused on keeping New Yorkers safe. We see a lot of hate um, today, and unfortunately, we have seen a rise in hate crimes across the city. It's something that we're focused on, and we're seeing this across the nation. Uh, that coupled with the way our children are being influenced by social media, uh, it is having a major impact on the spread of hate across this entire country, if not the globe. And one place where we have an opportunity to stop that hate from growing is our public schools. Uh, Chancellor Banks has really uh, focused on this uh, uh, this morning. We announced the release of a new curriculum of the public schools to teach students from grades 6 to 12 a very important time in their lives about hate crimes and bias incidents, as well as the impact hate has on individuals and communities. Uh, the curriculum is called teaching about hate crime and their impacts. And, you know, historically, I don't ever remember 
of we have that we have focused on teaching our children these very complicated topics that are playing outside of the ABCs in one, two, three. We have to start using these uh, environments where our students are to develop their full personhood and how they live together is so important. Not only academically smart, but emotionally intelligent. This is important. The goal is to provide training for educators and help them develop the lessons to stamp out hate. In recent weeks, we have seen so much vile anti-Semitism. We've seen uh, Islamophobia, anti-Sikhism. Uh, we've seen attacks on the LGBTQ plus community of uh, uh, hateful terminologies. So the goal is to be clear that there's no room for hate, and it starts with our young people. This curriculum is important, and we need to educate these young people. We need to meet this moment as their brains are still developing, as they are learning and, and approaching young adulthood, and as they are being bombarded with so many terrible messages on social media, and even as we move through our street. It includes uh, five lessons that empower educators to uh, enrich students' understanding of diversity, sharpen crucial um, critical thinking skills, and force a culture of increased civic engagement. And students will learn to identify motives and behaviors, which are so important, that cause hate crime, examine the impacts of current hate crime trends on communities, and design initiatives that promote inclusion, conclusion and collective action. And these children are ready. They're ready to engage in this conversation and move us in, a, in the right direction. Uh, this is important work. And we're not only educating our students in a holistic manner, uh, but also teaching them the dangers and influences that are susceptible to giving them the tools and skills to identify and address. Identifying the problem, solving the problem. And the economy, we announced yesterday, uh, First Deputy Mayor uh, Wright and I were out at York College. Uh, we're really excited when you look at one of the issues we had to lean into back when we took office was black unemployment. The numbers were dismal. Uh, for the first time, uh, we're seeing black un unemployment uh, go below uh, 8%. Uh, this is the first time since 2019. Uh, we are rebuilding our economy, and it starts with jobs, over 4.7 million jobs, more jobs in the history of the city. We need another bar for that also, by the way. Uh, and, you know, I don't have Katie here, so someone else can join me. Oh, where's Katie? Right Why are you there? hiding? You're normally in the front row. No, you know? I didn't, I didn't move chairs like that. <laughs> That's Manasha. Manasha does that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, my dear friend Katie, <laughs> crime is down and jobs are up. We're going to, by the, by, the, by the time the year's over, you're going to be quoting that well with me. <laughs> But in all seriousness, our economy um, is recovering, and it, it has uh, has been moving in the right uh, direction, but it has not been equitable. And that's why we lean into the issue around black unemployment rate. City, we have lowered the black unemployment rate citywide by 26 percent since coming into office, and it is now at its lowest level since 2019. We know we have still more to do, but we know we're trending in the right direction. And so t we announced a, an initiative that it really is an urban way of attracting uh, the uh, people to the jobs that are available in the city, because we have thousands of jobs that are available. I was with uh, J.P. Morgan this morning and with Jamie Dimon to talk about internship and employment. And so we have this amazing uh, new uh, ad campaign going out, Run This Town, an advertising campaign to connect New Yorkers uh, to uh, jobs. We're going to show a part of that video? Go ahead. New York, New York, it's a hell of a town, but it's time to boss up now. You got skills? Prove it. We want street smarts, book smarts, upstarts. Stand up and get started. New job, new career, new you, New York. This city needs you. We got salaries, pensions, benefits, real talk, real perks, nine to five, night shift, on call, part time, full time. Your time, your choice. It's time to run this town. So you're going to be seeing this video everywhere uh, pretty soon. You're going to see ads on, on bus 
buses uh, throughout the entire city. It's about reaching New Yorkers where they are uh, with our hiring halls, which is really local. Uh, this campaign is really an invitation challenge to New Yorkers to be part of the community. You can't complain about it. We have to be about it uh, by delivering the goods and services to our city. We're going to couple this with our Jobs NYC initiative and our hiring halls. Uh, this new campaign will uh, more easily bring the public and private sectors together. We're not, not only focusing on uh, public sector job, pu private sector job, we're going to be focusing on public sector jobs as well. Thank you. You know, say hello to everyone out there. <laughs> uh, livability, uh, as, always, as always, in order to make the city more livable, uh, to actually be able to afford to live here, yesterday we formally kicked off a public review of City of Yes. A little bit of housing built throughout the entire city. It has to happen. Uh, it is so important. We were really happy to have Shams the Baron with us. These zoning changes are, are another tool for us to address a citywide housing crisis, 1.4% vacancy rate. We said it over and over again. Uh, we want to build a little bit more. And when you think about it, 59 community boards, folks, 59 community boards uh, throughout this community districts in New York City. And in 2023, 10 of those community districts built as much housing as the rest of the 49 combined. <laughs> That's just unbelievable when you think about it. So it's a citywide effort of saying, yes, in my backyard, yes, on my block, yes, in my community. We can't just chant housing is a right. We have to participate in it. But this is our city, and it must be a citywide initiative. And so that's how we're going to make our city more livable. It takes many forms, but one critical way is by improving health in our communities. 80% of New Yorkers get one package delivered per week. Uh, that's more than 6 million people. And almost one in five New Yorkers get four or more packages per week. 90% of everything New Yorkers uh, re uh, receive arrives by truck. That's a lot of packages. It's a lot of trucks, and we know we have to do a better job in monitoring this. Now, the Department of Transportation last week announced that it's allocated $6 million to an off-hour delivery program to provide financial incentives for businesses to shift deliveries to the off-peak hours of 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Truck deliveries during daytime business hours contribute to traffic, increased carbon emission, and greater safety risk for, for pedestrians, cyclists, and others. And by providing financial incentives for businesses to shift these deliveries they receive uh, to off-peak hours, trucks will spend less time in traffic. You see them all the time. And it's a very important initiative. Hats off to Commissioner Donis Rodriguez for doing so. And we're not trading one problem for another. We're going to make sure this doesn't uh, bring extra noise, and we're never going to compromise our safety. The financial incentives include the installation of low noise equipment for delivery vehicles, building security uh, retrofits to enable unattended deliveries and safety e equipment, et cetera. <laughs> Lastly, uh, the is going to allow us to shift 62,000 daily trucks to off hours deliveries by 2040. Really good stuff. New Yorkers have a, a voice uh, in the last livability, and then we open up to question. Uh, starting May 1st and through June 12th, all New York City residents, 11 uh, old, uh, older, regardless, 11 years or older, regardless of immigration status, can vote in the People's Money, our citywide participatory budgeting program. I was the first borough president to do participatory budgeting when I was the borough president. Uh, we are allocating $3.5 million of city funds uh, available, and New Yorkers can decide on their favorite projects by visiting participate.nyc.gov. Last year, this program funded 46 projects in your communities, including violence pre prevention, job training, and community gardens. Uh, we have 8.3 million New Yorkers and they're going to give us 35 million opinions because that's how we do it in New York. And now that we're going to hear the opinions from our journalists, I turn it back over to you, Fabian. Thank you, Mayor. Let's go. Uh, 
Oh, I have two questions. That's a surprise. Yes. The first one is this. So in December, you said that if you were given the authority to close down illegal pot shops, you could close them all down within 30 days. Yes. So now the legislature has given you your wish. You now have the authority to close down the illegal pot shops. So it's April 30th. I'm wondering if you can have them all closed down by May 30th, which would be 30 days, or what is the plan? Is the plan, a great plan. We. We ideally, we would have loved to have the police department not have to be deputized, but they have to be deputized. Now that we have the the law was passed as a procedure to actually make it implemented, you know, after they uh, sign a bill in Albany, the governor signs the bill, now there's steps we have to do here also. And I was just uh, educated on all the steps we have to do. While this is taking place, the team has already identified the locations. We already have our operations in place and what we want to do. In addition to that, after we close a shop, they have to get a hearing in five days. Uh, within five days, we have to make sure we have the infrastructure with OAF to manage those hearings so we don't have an, a, a run on our uh, hearing process. But we have the infrastructure in place. The plea PD is on, on board. Deputy Mayor Banks has been a team leader on this with the sheriffs. And so you're going to see an operation of finally going after these illegal shops. What's your date? I mean, can you do it in 30 days? Well, we're going to make a substantial dent in 30 days. My second question has to do with this, the hate crime um, education plan that you just announced. Yes. And I'm wondering if this has anything to do with the demonstrations we're seeing on college campuses, Columbia, NYU, that, has been, that have been spewing a lot of hate. And if that, if the, what's been in the atmosphere, what's being heard all around the city, is driving your concern to try to get the minds of students before they get into the same kind of pattern that you're now seeing on college campuses, and what, how, how does this relate to what we're seeing at Columbia, what we're seeing at NYU, Pratt, other colleges? I, I like that. That's a, that's a good question. We used to do this in the police department. Um, we used to police in the ideal and not the real. Uh, we didn't create what was in the cities that we were policing, and we were almost ashamed to talk about those things. And we never talked about hate crimes when I went to school. We didn't talk about it even in college. We have to start being honest with ourselves that our children are coming into a different environment. And during those young, impressionable years, they may sit in the classroom with someone that wears a yarmulke, a hijab, a turban, but we try to ignore it and don't act like this is a reality. And so what we're hoping to do in the D Department of Education under the leadership of Chancellor Banks is to take a different uh, approach. Let's be honest about these conversations. And so by the time these children graduate, they are not uh, looking down on each other. They are going to have a different approach to it. And that's what we're hoping to do. And we foster a real dialogue, something that has not been done in schools in our city. And in, uh, I don't know, even know if in our, in our country, we want to act like these isms don't exist. We want to act like everything is a wonderful world, and it's just not. The shades of gray. Really, how do you deal with it? Social media, um, seem, it seems to have made it um, acceptable. It's a terrible word, but have made it acceptable to spew hate. And so, how do you, con when you have kids who see um, social media all the time, how do you counteract that, and how do you tell them it's not? acceptable to hate, that it's what you should do is respect people for their differences. And now think about it for a moment. Look at the, the holistic approach we have been saying. What you're seeing right now is the materializing of what this administration has been talking about. People were saying, why are y'all going after social media? Why are y'all demanding that they stop feeding poison to our children? Why are y'all putting breathing exercises in schools so children can manage their emotion? Why are y'all holding breaking bread, building bonds almost four years ago so that people can learn to appreciate diversity? Now you're seeing all the things that Eric was talking about, this hippie approach to life that people used to say, we are broken in so many places. And what we have been doing as an administration is not to ignore that. We saw 
this building up for years. And when you do an analysis of all of these initiatives, uh, when Ingrid and I were talking about breaking bread, building bonds, and Borough Hall, of having different groups come together and sit around and talk to each other. We live in a diverse city, but we're isolated. And now that isolation has become a weapon against us. And so the goal is to fight social media, what they're doing to our children, the goal is to continue to do uh, very creative ways, such as our faith-based initiatives, our breaking bread, bread building bonds, to teach in our schools ab about diversity. We know we have to build this from the ground up, and now folks are starting to see this is what this mayor was talking about. If we allow this to get out of control, we're going to reach the moment that we're in right now across the country. Marsha, I would just add first to the question that you asked, no, hate is not acceptable ever. Um, but we've already been under, uh, underway on this uh, hate crimes curriculum. About 900 middle school and high school uh, um, principals have been already trained on this. We're going to continue to do that. And then the principals and assistant principals are going to, or vice principals are going to train their teachers to do the same. Hey, Mr. Mayor, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Good. Um, I have two questions for yes. you. Um, about the situation at Columbia. Um, mm -hmm. You've talked about this a lot in recent days, and you've said that university leadership has not asked the NYPD to be on campus, but there was an asterisk, and they wanted officers around the perimeter. My first question is, um, could you tell us a little bit about the thought process behind that? Is the idea to have police officers there sort of as a standby in case something escalates quickly? And my second question is, are there any updates about the students who um, occupy the <coughs> building overnight? Has that changed the NYPD's involvement now that they're sort of barricaded in this structure there? Um, and if you have any updates for us on that. Uh, the, and, and you said the thought process behind the, the so police yeah, department. The one, well, I guess both. Like, I, you guys okay. seem like you're, in, you're working together on this to right. some extent. Right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 last week, uh, uh, Camille had a meeting with all of the presidents, and we communicated with them uh, as well. Listen, this is a challenging moment for presidents, and I am not trying to uh, make it appear as though uh, they don't want to create an environment where children can uh, be educated and also respect the tradition of peaceful protests on our uh, college stages. Uh, uh, I think many of us here uh, in our co uh, uh, collegiate years protested. I know I protested for South Africa and, and apartheid. Um, I know all of us experienced. I protested with uh, Amadou Diallo. Uh, you know, when I was at New York City Technical College, I participated in protests. I participated in protests in John Jay College. And so this is a very challenging moment for them, but it's also a teaching moment. And we can't, our college campuses cannot be used to uh, call for the extermination of any group. Some of the terminologies that were used were just really harmful and despicable. That's not who we are as a country. You, can, you can't call for peace by using violence. That's not acceptable. And I believe it's imperative that we continue to coordinate uh, with uh, our uh, presidents we're going to respect their right to determine when they want uh, police involvement. And when they ask us, we're going to carry out the necessary exercises to do it with a minimum amount of force uh, to not in any way harm faculty, uh, students, or uh, the law enforcement personnel. It was unfortunate what happened at NYU that people were throwing um, bottles and chairs, and uh, thank God those officers had on helmets, helmets to protect themselves. And so it's the right balance. Uh, what was planned out with taking over buildings, uh, you have to be very careful because it can continue to elevate. And we cannot allow the elevation of actions like that. And so the police department is going to brief me uh, later. We're going to communicate with Columbia and make the determination on what the next steps are that we're going to uh, institute. So the, the police presence sort of at the, the entrances to the university and outside is that more coming from you? Uh, we just want to have the police there just in case, or is that coming more from the university saying, we want you to be outside but not inside? Universities, they ask us to come into all the entry points uh, to monitor that. I've said this over and over again. You would be surprised how many people that are on these grounds don't attend the schools. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, the uh, unwillingness to show ID, uh, you know, there they are folks who are coming in and just, you know, just really, I believe they're, they're coming in and they're hijacking almost this entire uh, operation. And police have to protect the streets. The entry to the school is on the streets, and it's, it's, it's important to protect the streets, protect, protect the passage, the right of way, students who are going to the school. Now, you may have uh, 500 people who are protesting, but you have thousands of students that are just trying to pass the final. They just want to get into school and pass the final, and we cannot allow them not to be able to continue to do their job. In this city, you can have a duality. People can protest, but the city can still function, and they should be able to do it, be able to function without imitation, in, in, intimidation, without violence, uh, without attacks. And when you do an analysis, this department, you don't, this police department, you're not seeing out of those 500 something um, protests, you're not seeing people injured. You're seeing police managing of uh, the the balance of the right to protest and the right for people to go on with their lives. And so it may not be illegal to say some of the things that we've heard, but I think it's immoral. And we should not remain silent because there's no room for hate in the city. Yeah. On, on that uh, issue, oh. with, uh, would you No, no, just, that's okay. Go ahead. I'll sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Chris Lorios of NBC. Um, on that issue of balancing you know, legitimate expression, political expression, dissent, and also trying to make sure we don't have hate environments, what is your estimation? How much of these demonstrations at NYU and Columbia are characterized by hate, and how much of them are characterized by legitimate expressions of dissent? Uh, I, don't, I don't have you know, the exact numbers, and I would be wrong if I were to tell you 50, 50, 40, 60. I don't know. Uh, I do know when we do an observation, uh, there's some familiar faces that we have witnessed in many uh, protests. Uh, and I'm sure if you were to quiz them, what is it about, they probably don't even know. Uh, but so I don't know. Uh, I think there are concerns on both sides of the, this issue. And people um, have a right to display their concerns, but it should never reach the point of violence. It should never reach the point of, of hate. The violence we can handle due to the legality of it, uh, the hateful terminology, uh, I think protesters should police themselves and say, this is not what we stand for. Uh, this is not what we're about. And I, I'm not saying enough of that. Thank you. Um I didn't realize there was a fellow Chris. Sorry. Uh, no, you're good. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Hassan Naveed, your uh, former executive director of hate crimes prevention, yes. was fired um, last month. Uh, he was not given a reason. He's telling us, I'm wondering if you can share what the reason of why he was fired and who ultimately made the call to fire him. Um, your press office actually put out a statement saying he had put himself uh, before fighting uh, hate crimes. I'm wondering if you can also clarify what exactly that means. And then just on two other topics, um, with Arva Rice, the uh, interim chair of the CCRB, we reported last week that Deputy Mayor Phil Banks has been pushing for her ouster since last summer, including uh, introducing a person who was never appointed to the board as her replacement. I'm wondering, were you aware of what, aware of what uh, DM Banks was doing there, and did you support his activities? And then just to follow up on Marsha's question, too, about um, the weed shops, when, when does that 30-day clock start? That uh, we're talking? It, 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 st it started a year ago. You know, I always wanted them closed down. And so now we, ex we have the uh, tools, we have the authority, and we're going to start kicking into place. So. On the 31st day, don't be standing in front of City Hall saying, hey, I saw a weed shop. Because they're going to continue to open, we have to continue to close them. We have the tools now. When they pop up, we can close them. That's the tool we needed, you know. And we're going to execute that plan. And we're going to, we're going to become a model for the rest of the country that's dealing with this. New York has asked for this. We fought for it. We got it. But trust me when I tell you, there will be those that even when we close them, they're going to try to find a loophole to open them again. Our goal is to say, give us a tool. Thanks for what uh, uh, Tiffany did, Ingrid, Diane, um, going up. And we have the tools, so we're going to execute. Uh, to speak about uh, uh, Avra, 
Aubrey was a, a um, she was an interim. She was acting. Everybody keep it, they forget that. She was acting. She was not appointed as the chair. She was acting. For two years, it remained acting. All of my DMs come give, give me advice, but the buck stops with the mayor. And so she was acting. She could stay on the board. I, I'm, I'm lost that people don't see that the mayor should appoint who he wants to be his chair. I mean, I, that, that's baffling to me. These are not lifetime positions. You don't, you don't stay there forever. <laughs> you know, great job, good job. We, we want you to stay on the board and continue to give input. She has been great with the Urban League. She has good advice. We want you to be there. But I want my chair. You know, you've acted, you held it down for us for two years, but now this, this is an active position. So no one is forcing anyone out. It's about, do you want someone that's going to be your choice? Should it ever be a permanent chair? I'm, I'm, I'm lost on that. You know, so she was, she was in an acting capacity. She did a great job. She stood up in her acting capacity. Now we need a permanent chair so we could deal with the issues on CC, CCRB. And with, um, uh, we're seeing an increase in hate crime. You're, you're, you're given a responsibility um, in a role. You're in charge of hate crimes. I'm seeing an increase in hate crime. You know, so to believe that you're fired because you're Muslim, I, I mean, as many Muslim staffers that I have, I, and I can't go into the details of it because there's a lawsuit. Let the, let the lawyers figure it out. People have to live up to what they're hired to do. Taxpayers deserve that. So with, with Ms. Rice, I'm just curious, so is it performance-related that you want to re replace her? You're not having the job she's doing? I wanted, I wanted my chair that I appointed. The previous chair that was acting did a good job in an acting capacity. They did a good job in acting capacity. But when you come into an administration, two years, this wasn't immediate. You come into an administration, you then look, all the boards, all of these deputy mayors up here, they have a portfolio of boards. They're looking over all the boards and they're making the determination. Those who are holdovers, they're making a the determination on who they want new chairs. We appointed many new chairs. This is what all these deputy mayors are looking over and doing and making that determination. We wanted a permanent chair, and that's what that's what we've done. And she she can still remain in um, in uh, on the board. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, Mr. How Mayor. I'm well, sir. How are you? Good. 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 So, Mr. Mayor, I want to pivot back to a few months ago, uh, and uh, um, Executive Director Jacques Gia was here, when I asked you about the assistant school safety agent positions. Yes. And um, so now um, I've, I've learned that um, you, the city, um, has gotten the okay to hire, to create the title, and hire 400 um, assistant school safety agents. Um, and there's a DCAS hearing next week, May 8th. It's on the DCAS uh, website. So, Mr. Mayor, with this assistant school safety agent, it's 18 to 21 year olds, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's union job, union benefits, 237. Um, my question is is there going to be any, and I see we have the jobs town hall uh, going on, but is there going to be any collaboration between? Um, say, for example, uh, Deputy Mayor Almanza and uh, the Department of Education, Chancellor Banks, and his team to get this information out to our uh, rising 18-year-olds and also our young people in the, like, the extended uh, education programs that we have to let them know that here is this opportunity, it's brand new, it's 400 jobs for our youth, 18 to 21, and get this information out to them that this is a start, like that ad says, because the ground floor is just the beginning. This is the ground floor for our 18 to 21 year olds, and it's also addressing our uh, school safety agent uh, shortages in the school. So. Well said. Well, collaboration and. How are we getting this information out to our communities and our, and our youth? 400 jobs yep. for 18-year-olds. Yep. Well said, well said. Number one, we were big on, member. a lot of people were talking about removing school safety agents out of schools. I was very clear on the campaign trail. That's not going to happen as mayor. 
and DM uh, Amazar. Uh, ha we have been doing just that. Everything from flyers at train stations, partnering with our local electors, doing the hiring halls, uh, making sure that our faith-based community is involved in it. Exactly what you're saying. Far too often, good jobs remained uh, vacant because no one was going on the ground communicating directly with them. Uh, Commissioner uh, Pinnock over at DCAS really partnered with DC37 uh, to really put in place hiring halls in the box it has been a real win for us, and we're going we're gonna to do just that, let young folks know about this job as a school safety agent. And if I, yeah, and if I could just also add, the career pathways is a big priority of the administration under the mayor and the chancellor, and have been making those direct connections with employers. And one other thing I just want to note is that the chancellor was a school safety agent. <laughs> so if you start at the bottom, now he's here. <laughs> um, that we, we certainly believe in that and that career trajectory. And I do just want to uh, clarify one thing as it relates to um, cannabis. The law was passed but then rules have to be enacted before we can do anything. So that's still in process. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight, but uh, we're ready to go. Yep, yep, well said. Hi, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to follow up on Chris's question. Did you specifically speak to Arbor Rice that it wasn't a performance thing that you wanted specifically to appoint your own chair? I also wanted to go back to the Corporation Council. I wanted to know, has she uh, submitted a letter of resignation to your office at all or indicated that she's resigning from that position? You floated the idea that you are potentially looking at somebody else. And when is that effective? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. I don't go into private conversations. We all know that. And uh, personnel decisions are decisions I make with this team that's sitting up here. Judge submitted a letter of resignation. I don't go into private conversation and inter office interactions. This team up here makes our determinations. Two questions. How are you? Good. 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 Um, two questions. One local the uh, Tony DiNapoli swimming pool in Greenwich Village it closed down temporarily in 2019. Mm -hmm still is not open now, and it's not going to open in 2024. What's going on there, and when's that swimming pool going to open? It's on Clarkson Street. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, ooh, I might have turned this off instead of on. I apologize. Yes, that is a building um, and the pool facility that needs renovations and upgrades. So it is one of the high priorities on the park's capital projects list. And we're going through several scenarios to ensure that we can make the best investment for the neighborhood to bring the maximum amount of recreation space, um, as well as being able to do it in a cost-effective manner. The other question is, um, the $58 million that was cut from the libraries, uh, part of the budget cuts, you've restored a lot of agencies' um, funding. Uh, libraries, as far as I know, have not been restored. Is there any plan to restore them and have them being able to reopen on Sundays, which now none of them can? With, uh, it's very important. The administration de did not determine that libraries should close Saturday and Sundays. Everyone was given instructions to find efficiencies. They determined how. That's number one. Number two, the budget, dance, and music is still playing. Let's allow it to finish before we do a full evaluation. Uh, Speaker Adams and I have successfully landed two budgets during some very difficult times, and we're going to continue uh, to do so. We know how important libraries are. I used them a lot when I was in school. Uh, we got it. That's why we were extremely uh, understanding during the pegs in January. There was no peg in April. Uh, no um, uh, uh, efficiency challenge for them as well. And so let's let's let the speaker and the mayor and their team finish moving forward on this. So it's possible there could be a reopening. Yeah, in New York City, we click our heels together and we know everything is possible. <laughs> this is where dreams are made in the great city of New York. <coughs> Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good. I'm going to also ask you about the protests. Okay. Um, have you had conversations with the governor about the National Guard? That's my first question. And what is your opinion 
on whether or not she should consider bringing them in if mm -hmm. things continue to escalate. My second question is on the NYPD and social media, in particular Chief Shell. Mm -hmm. um, I know originally you said that you are supportive of them using social media to fight back against what they think is biased or unfair or inaccurate reporting. But around the protests, um, Chief Shell has also been opining on the, the character of the students. And you know, I'm going to read something that he wrote recently. Um, actions have consequences. No more suspensions. Let's try expulsion of these entitled, hateful students. Pack your belongings and get out. Let's remove faculty and staff who have replaced their educational licenses for a license of hate. You're fired. I'm asking about it because obviously this is his opinion, but on the chance that the NYPD does have to go in, doesn't this create a lot of tension when they do have to go in while he's putting out you know, his, his opinion on what these students and faculty are standing for? First, with the governor, as you know, um, it's a standard belief. I'm not going to go into private conversations on what the governor and I talk about. Uh, and by the way, she has been amazing for the city of New York, amazing team, and up to Albany. We got everything we we ask for, basically, and I cannot thank her, Speaker Hasty, and Majority Leader Cousins. Um, extremely excited what the year is going to bring. Um, the, we don't need the National Guard. This The NYPD is doing an amazing job in the right balance that is needed. Uh, these officers are commendable. I think that if any of you were there for the NYU, you saw the level of discipline that they showed. Uh, you, you're seeing a different approach uh, to handling this. And our leaders were on the ground. They were not removed. Uh, they were on the ground. And so uh, I think that uh, if there's a need for additional resources, we know how to pick up and request them. Uh, that need is not at this moment. And uh, down to uh, Chief Shell, uh, we have a very uh, opinionated, uh, not only uh, chief, uh, commissioners, reporters, students, dishwashers, candlestick makers, Everyone has an opinion in New York. 8.3 million people, 38 million opinions. And they love sharing it. And I find that when you share your opinion, it's not bottled up. So let's just share our opinion. But let's be kind while we do it. And, you know, loving kindness would get us through this all. Professional. Chief Shell is a professor. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yes, you? Hello, Mr. Mayor. I have a question about City of Yes uh, housing. Uh, I know it's going under public review. District 30th, Queens, Middle, Village, Glendale, those areas. There are concerns about power grids, about uh, sewage that is older, about uh, flooding, and they're concerned that uh, proceeding with City of Yes in that area before fixing these things will create more problems. Mm -hmm. Could you please? Um, Address that, uh, how would you respond to those concerns? Well, there is always a reason not to build, but there's one big reason to build, 1.4% vacancy. And people always talk about why we shouldn't build. A little bit more housing throughout the entire city. Uh, Maria, you want to add anything on yes, that? Of course. Um, thank you for that question, Monica. So here's what's at stake. We talk every week here. Um, and we're like a broken record about it, but um, I think what's good is that people are starting to sing the same tune, right? We have a housing crisis that the city has, um, hasn't seen in many, many decades. The 1.4% vacancy rate, the more than 100,000 people who are sleeping in shelters, what's at the root of that is we haven't built enough. And as the mayor mentioned, the 59 community districts, um, 10 of them have produced as much housing as the other 49 combined. And so the City of Yes for Housing Opportunity finally provides us with a way of building more housing a little bit in every neighborhood to make a big dent. Of course, 
We have to listen to every single question and address them. We did a full environmental review to understand what the impacts are. And the reality is that while um, there is a big impact across the board in terms of housing units, the type of impacts that you are mentioning in terms of infrastructure, the environmental review is showing that that is not significant. And so we'll continue the work with every single community board because we have to, but to do nothing or to, um, uh, uh, to not build to cower because there are concerns means that we are doing a disservice to New Yorkers, many of whom are facing insecurity. The final thing I'll say about this is that this is 100,000 homes, new homes, over the course of the next 10 to 15 years. But it is also about jobs and economic impact, right? Because there are 260,000 jobs, too, that we can create if we build that number of homes. It's about $60 billion of economic output. And one of the most staggering um, statistics that I saw, just to give everyone a sense of what's at stake here, our housing scarcity um, challenge in this region, you know how much it costs us in terms of economic input, um, output in any uh, particular year? Um, $225 billion mm -hmm. for the region. That is what's at stake. It has both human consequences and fiscal consequences. And so as we go through this process, we kicked off public review just, um, just this week. We're gonna speak with every community board, go to um, work with borough presidents, of course, the city planning commission, and then finally with the city council um, towards the end of this year. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot is at stake and, and we know that New Yorkers uh, will be with us because when we stood at the rally yesterday, I hope everyone saw, it wasn't just members of the administration. It was a broad, diverse coalition of New Yorkers, houses of worship, labor, tenant organizers, um, uh, organizations representing seniors, representing young people across the five boroughs. And that's the coalition that's now all singing from the same hymnal. And we're committed to getting this done and building in a way that makes sense for New Yorkers. And I just want to add, um, oh, sorry, I think I've done the same thing. DDC and DEP, at, at the start of the administration, we celebrated um, a significant amount of gray infrastructure. That's the sewer system in Southeast Queens that was completed, and that work is ongoing. Millions of dollars are being in inve invested. And citywide, and this will affect Queens, we're also looking at every way we can do double duty. That is, make all of our land absorbent so that we are able to handle the climate crisis that's ahead of us and the incoming rain at greater volumes and, and more intensity. And so as part of the state of the city, the mayor announced a five borough blue belt plan, and that will include Queens as well. So um, as we, you know, we can walk and chew gum. So as we develop housing, we will also be pursuing, um, because of housing and because of the climate crisis we're in, every resiliency measure possible. And I, and I just want to say that um, this team is extremely responsible, Dia, um, uh, Maria's team, it, they're responding to all the needs. Community, each community should feel secure knowing that their needs are going to be responded to. And those two deputy mayors are joined at the hip. Mm -hmm. uh, housing and infrastructure go hand in hand. And this is very, very thoughtful what is being rolled out. And it will benefit the city in all the ways that it have just mentioned. And hats off to Dan Garodnik. He's done an amazing job. That's right. Mr. Mayor, how are you? This afternoon. Hey, Bolt. Um, so maybe you can just clarify legally, just to understand with Columbia, now that these students have barricaded themselves in this building, is the decision not to go in because you legally can't, because it's private property and the Columbia has asked you to, or is this a conversation? Like, at what point can you make the decision as the NYPD, something has happened, they barricaded themselves in, something happened that they, you can go in, the NYPD can go in. How does that work? And um, just following up on the, uh, the death of um, Derek Floyd. Uh, the, the fire commissioner told us today that she wants to do everything she can to get him his pension and he's working with city and state lawmakers, but you know, wouldn't this have just been easier to keep him on the FDNY at that point, somebody with a heart condition who was working full time for the FDNY, and he was one of 11 let go. So how is that not layoffs? If it was 11 people that were terminated or provisionally, 
firefighters who have been there for years at this point, how, what, what is the categorization that your administration has of layoffs? Of, of, of first, um, we are in constant communication with the college daily, and, and probably hourly. Uh, and the strategy is a combination of, of what the commission is doing and what the college is doing. We're going to continue to do that, and we're going to be very respectful. Um, when it comes, it's a really tragic situation. Uh, the young man lost his, uh, the long, young man transition. Um, he, he, he was never qualified to be a firefighter because he didn't get through the academy because of his heart condition. And so we can't just say, okay, you, you were brought on to be a firefighter. You don't qualify. We're just going to hold you on the payroll anyway. Can't do that. Just can't. It's, that's just, that is not how you use taxpayers' dollars. And we have not done any layoffs. We have not increased our taxes. In spite of what we have gone through, from fiscal cliffs to the migrant asylum seeker, I think we're up to 191,000 now. We have not laid off. 191? 194. 194. We have not. Our heart goes out to this family. <laughs> we're going to assist as much as possible uh, within our legal rest restrictions. But this was not part of a PEG. This was part of this young man did not pass the requirements because of his medical condition to become a firefighter. That's what he wanted to be, to be, and we commend him uh, for wanting to, to join the New York Bravest, but that is the reality that we're facing. But we're in contact with the family. We want to help as much as possible. So why did you so we're time, time. Time. we have time for two more. No matter when you determine something, anything can happen during that determination. That's, that's just <laughs> like, that's how life is. You know, you could, you could determine something on Monday and something could happen on Tuesday. That's just life. He, his, his medical condition did not allow him to become a firefighter. And it's so unfortunate because he appeared to have been a great young man that would have been great to the, to the FDNY, but that was the reality of what we were facing. And we're going to be here for the family as much as possible. I would also point out, Craig, that the separation occurred before the November pegs took effect. Yes. Hey, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So I'm wondering what creative solutions are coming out of the Department of Education to address the um, attendance crisis that's happening right now with a lot of the students, and apologies if you've answered this before. Um, but yeah, I haven't heard anything about what's being done to address the attendance crisis and what sort of outreach has happened with the parents to find out why this is happening. Well, I, I think that and we should have um, Chancellor Banks and come in and give you a full overview of the dis different initiatives that we've done from Project Pivot and others to go and find those children. Uh, I'm not an expert on this topic, on what's causing this from happening, but a lot of children during COVID just never returned. And we have to go find them. We have to give them the support they need to get them back into the school system. COVID created a lot of trauma for our young people. You know, we talk about how it impacted adults and those adults who are not coming back to the work environment. Another conversation that Jamie Diamond and I had today, uh, many adults haven't come back to the work environment. Many children haven't come back to the school environment. And Chancellor Banks has zeroed in on that. And I think that we should have him come in and give a full briefing of what his team is doing around that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good. Um, you described the, the occupation of Hamilton Hall at Columbia as like an elevation of the, an escalation of the situation, which obviously it is, but you also suggested escalation can lead to further escalation. Can you talk about what, what more precisely you're concerned about? And then um, on the Central Park, sort of uh, the rise in petty crime there, I know today Jeff Madry said that he would be sending in more officers. Do you have any numbers on how many officers you plan to send? I think Jeff did a briefing, and so um, I would, you should communicate with exactly with, with Jeff. I think we get forty. Would we get forty million a year? Uh, um, we million? have um, of people that that, and this is a pre-COVID number of the number of people that visit Central Park is a conservatively forty million a year. It's gone up. We su we suspect uh, post COVID, so it is a com very crowded and thankfully so. It's a wonderful asset that the city has, um, but it is a highly visited area in New York City. And so we have we saw those series of four um, serious crime 
crimes that were there. These guys are doing an amazing job. That's one of the safest parks uh, in our city. Uh, we don't want a pattern. And uh, that's why, uh, Chief Madge, we understand the park is representative of the heart of the city. And so we're going to zero in on them. Listen, th because of their response strategically and precision policing, that's why our numbers continue to drop across the city in those areas. And we're going to zero in on that. And they, they have a plan for that. Um, <coughs> the uh, the uh, escalation, it starts with the tent <coughs> and moves to other actions as we saw last night. And we just have to closely monitor, and that's what we're doing.